Um, hi, I'm Jess. I'm one of the interns at the Reykjavik Grapevine. Uh, and welcome to the Reykjavik newscast. Um, today we are in Koppa, I think is how you pronounce it, um, on the uh, old harbour in Reykjavik, overlooking the beautiful Mount Estia. And today we're talking to Dr. Matthew Roby, uh, who is doing a postdoctorate at the University of Iceland. And we're going to talk all about the Icelandic sagas. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me on. Can you just start by telling us a little bit more about what your studies are at the university? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, right now I'm just beginning a postdoctoral project um, which focuses on depictions of sexual consent um, in the medieval Icelandic romance sagas. Although uh, all of my graduate studies at Oxford, my master's and PhD, focused on um, depictions of the supernatural mm -hmm. uh, in th throughout the saga corpus. So that was uh, w witches, ghosts, other kinds of trollish beings. Um, and my intention there was to look at the supernatural depictions uh, as a way to talk about medieval Icelandic norms surrounding sexuality particularly wow. adolescent sexuality mm -hmm. and elderly sexuality. Gosh, that's uh, quite a subject. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what drew you to the Icelandic sagas in the first place? Obviously, they're a big deal in Iceland, but yes. you are an Englishman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, I came to the Icelandic sagas through uh, medieval English literature. Mm -hmm. I started doing my master's degree in medieval English literature at Oxford, um, but started to look at Norse at that point. Uh, found these supernatural depictions, which are so fascinating, uh, throughout the uh, medieval Icelandic sagas, and so decided to focus on those. Brilliant. Um, so what do um, the portrayals of supernatural creatures and events in the sagas um, mean? What can they say to us? Yeah, um, well, obviously, on a basic level, the mm -hmm. depictions of the supernatural, they probably had an effect on the audiences of the sagas, whether the, the audiences found them to be entertaining or, or scary. Um, some scholars look at uh, depictions of the supernatural to try and access medieval belief systems. Mm -hmm. So many depictions of the supernatural uh, are not actually connected to either paganism or, or Christianity, but some of them are. For example, there's a lot of depictions of witches whose powers uh, are derived from uh, pagan magic. Uh, and so some scholars uh, look at them to try and access aspects of uh, pre-Christian pagan religion, or mm -hmm. at least, uh, probably more accurately speaking, uh, what the late medieval Icelandic Christian authors who wrote the sagas thought about the, the, the pre-Christian past. Um, and they can also tell us about perhaps what they believe themselves, whether the uh, late medieval Icelanders, despite being Christian, also uh, harbored superstitions about witches and ghosts uh, and, and other trollish things mm -hmm. going on. Um, but I myself tend to look at them as indicative of ideas and ideologies about various subjects especially subjects that are perhaps uncomfortable uh, and, and cannot be addressed through uh, direct or realistic depictions. Um, so, for, for example, if someone in a, in a supernatural story, uh, whether it's the, the monster itself or whether it's a human interacting with mm -hmm. the monster, if they have a particular trait like greediness or a particular demographic marker, like if they have a particular gender, uh, ethnic background, mm -hmm. or a particular, they belong to a particular age group, they seem to be able to reveal aspects of what the medieval Icelanders thought about that particular idea or, or age group. And like I said, they're particularly good at accessing ideas that are maybe sensitive or uncomfortable yeah. uh, and, and can't be discussed in naturalistic that's depictions. That's so interesting. So do you think that's part of the reason why sort of interest in the sagas has endured for so long because they are still kind of held as these very important pieces of literature yeah. in Icelandic culture. Yeah, certainly. I, I think they, they can reveal um, they can reveal things about the, the, the medieval Icelandic culture to scholars and to the Icelanders themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and monsters, of course, p p depictions of monsters throughout all literatures, not just Icelandic, uh, they continue to be popular because the monster can always um, uh, can always sort of embody uh, w whatever it is that's going on, but, w but we, m we might not want to discuss. So, I mean, in medieval Icelandic texts, uh, the undead 
sort of zombie vampire type ghosts they might represent various things like uh, greediness or failure to obey certain Icelandic uh, norms and conventions but vampires and other beings like that continue to embody things that we find troubling at various stages mm -hmm. in, in, in our history like in, in the 19th century the vampire can stand for concerns with the parasitic uh, upper class um, and of course as a blood disease vampires can then be they, 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 they embodied um, concerns about the AIDS, the AIDS crisis in the 20th century um, they can embody concerns about pandemics. So, I mean, the, the monster is always ready to embody whatever it is that we are concerned about. Um, so, did the medieval writers believe in the supernatural things that they were writing about? Uh, undoubtedly, um, some of them must have believed in uh, some of these things or, or had, had super, uh, superstitions about them, trolls and, and witches and ghosts. Um, but there is a lot of good evidence that some people were skeptical or, or, or didn't believe in them as well. So, in um, in some saga genres where the narrator can speak directly uh, to the audience, they might apologize for some of the supernatural stuff that's in it. Like, oh, if, if you don't happen to believe in this weird stuff that's in this saga, um, at least you can try and enjoy it for entertainment, or maybe go and find something else to read and leave this one yeah. alone. Um, and then even in some genres uh, where the narrator is less likely to speak to the audience directly, like the classic family sagas, where the narrator almost never presents themselves. Um, even there, there are some, uh, some indications that there was a lack of belief uh, where the narrator will uh, distance themselves from uh, a story about the supernatural uh, through, through layers of insulation. So they might say, and uh, some, there's a particular example in, in Erbegi Saga where the narrator says, and some people say that fishermen who saw this said <laughs> that this happened, right? Yeah. And so it's not just one layer of, of, of distance, which sometimes you get when, it, when there's a question in the sagas like, you know, uh, where was the gold actually buried? Oh, some people say it was buried in a waterfall. Mm -hmm. Some people say it was buried in a bog. In this instance, in Erbegi Saga, there are two layers of distance. The narrator doesn't want to give credence to the story, the narrator simply says, and some people say that other people said yeah. that this super, that supernatural thing happened. It's like um, they say these days people won't say that they don't believe in elves. They just won't say it. They won't deny the existence of elves, but they won't say specifically mm -hmm. that they believe in them. Mm -hmm. They're just like, yeah, I'm not going to say they don't exist, mm -hmm. just in case. Yeah. yeah. Um, what should you do if you see one of these entities from the sagas? Oh right. Well, yeah, they get dealt with in various ways mm -hmm. uh, by the saga heroes. I mean, if you if you encounter a ghost, um, medieval Icelandic ghosts are uh, that they're not the ghostly uh, sort of non-physical entities that we might associate okay. with ghosts nowadays. They're more like zombies. So usually they tend to have to be wrestled. Oh, uh, you need to take the body and do something with it, so, so, so you, you can fight it. Uh, once you've got it down, you can you can burn it, cremate it to stop it from coming back. Uh, sometimes I should be they, writing this down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just in case you come across one, especially on Halloween. Um, sometimes the medieval uh, protagonists in the sagas, um, particularly when they're dealing with the undead, they have to decapitate mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the body of, of, of the undead uh, person and to put the put the head somewhere, whether it's between the legs or somewhere near near the, the, the crotch okay. or the buttocks. Interesting. So, yeah. It's interesting that you said that ghosts were more like zombies than the kind of the yeah. apparitions that we know them as. Yeah, I mean that, that's probably the best modern term to describe them yeah. because they they they're usually not non-physical apparitions. They get up out of the ground and go and haunt people. Okay. Uh, in a physical way, beating them up or beating up livestock. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, 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 there is no perfect term to describe them. They have been described as vampires, they have been described as ghosts, uh, but zombie is a pretty good term. The best word is probably revenant, because okay. they're just uh, the dead who've come back to life yeah. physically, in a physical form. And are they always depicted as being evil, or are there any nice monsters um, in the sagas? Yeah, I mean, some, some of the monsters in the sagas, witches, ghosts, other trollish things, sometimes they do seem evil. Um, because of what they do, they, 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 can, they can be quite nasty, they can harm people. But it's probably a better way to look at it that they just have their own um, loyalties. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they're either in it for themselves or, they, or they're in it for the people that they want to protect. Um, so I mean, uh, one witch in the sagas actually, uh, in Essia, who in fact yes. lived on the mountain 
uh, behind us, mm -hmm. according to the saga. Or at least she had a cave on the mountain where she hid her foster son from his enemies. Uh, she wound-proofs him in preparation for uh, a battle, and then she hides him on a, in a cave on the mountain. Um, and she prevents him from giving up an area of strategic advantage by going down the mountain to fight 15 people, by giving him a stabbing pain in his eyes. Uh, and so he, he's allowed to be brave, and it's sort of her fault that he didn't go yeah. and fight them. Um, and so we would say that she's good because she's trying to, to protect the hero of the saga. Um, but then there is this, a very similar instance where a foster mother is, is trying to protect her foster son at the end of Gretis saga. The great hero, Gretir, is an outlaw hiding out on the island of, of Drange. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of an impenetrable fortress. And so one of his enemies has a, a, a supernatural foster mother who bewitches him using a magical piece of wood. Um, and causes him to, to be weaker when his enemies come. Uh, and so because he's the hero, people might say, oh, this, this foster mother, uh, her name is Thurider. Um, people might say, oh, she's evil. Yeah. But of course, she, if, if you look at it from the perspective of her foster son, Thorbjörn Ungutl, um, she's just trying to protect his interests. Yeah. And so it's prob yeah, probably the best to say that they just have their own interests at heart. They have their own... Uh, Misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because because of course the reason we think that uh, Thuri the in Gretis saga is bad is because she is doing something bad to the hero. Yeah. But if we were on Thurbjorn's side, we would think this is good. Mm -hmm. um, so, what drew you particularly to the um, sort of sexual nature and sexual depiction of uh, the characters in these stories? Supernatural depictions are especially good at symbolising topics that are a source of potential discomfort. Um, because you're, because there's a layer of distance mm -hmm. between uh, the, the reality of what you're discussing and, and the thing you're actually portraying. Um, and so sexuality is obviously one of those topics. Uh, although there are some exceptions, um, medieval Icelandic literature doesn't uh, go into great depth and great detail about certain sexual topics mm -hmm. because it's a topic of some delicacy, some sensitivity. Uh, and, but when you look at some of the portrayals of the supernatural, you'll see that they have really obvious sexual significance. Um, and the clearest example is um, almost like a uniform that some of the uh, mountain-dwelling ogre-type trolls wear in the sagas, which is um, uh, a leather dress which is too short, and so it can reveal things at the back or it can reveal things yeah. at the front. Um, uh, it just comes up to the belly button, it says, sometimes. Um, and so obviously this, is, uh, this has some sexual significance, uh, and so we have to wonder, okay, well, if these trolls are sexually symbolic, are they revealing things about medieval Icelandic ideas about sexual norms and sexual deviance? Yeah. Um, do you have any favourite spooky tales from the sagas that you can tell um, me? We're getting towards Halloween, so yeah, I feel yeah. like we could set the scene with a spooky there is, there, is one, there is one really good one, which is very complicated. It's, it's from the first uh, of the family sagas that I ever read, mm -hmm. called Erbikja Saga. Um, it's very complicated. There are all kinds of weird things going on. There's a blood rain. A, a seal apparition comes out of the fire pit. There's an apparition of a moon on the wall. Um, but since we're coming to Halloween, it's probably best to focus on the, the ghosts that are in that, that yes, saga, please. or zombies, however you want to call them. <laughs> um, so there is an old woman who, who, who comes to stay at the farm Frothau, which is near modern-day Olavsvik on Snæfellsnes. Mm -hmm. um, she's an older woman, and she has really excellent clothing, really excellent bed sheets and beautiful clothes. Um, but she refuses to sell them to anyone or let anyone else use them, which particularly annoys the younger housewife who, who lives at Frodau. Uh, anyway, the old woman happens to die after, after the blood rain, and she says, all of these nice items, they have to be burned. You can't let anyone use them, uh, because it seems that there's a curse on them, whether it's a curse that she put on it to protect them or whether it's something that she can't control. Uh, but anyway, after she's died, the young housewife chooses to take them and use them for herself, and that's where the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. um, so there is one... It, the, the, fir the first thing that it does is cause, uh, like, a pandemic of haunting. Uh, people start to fall ill on the farm, and then after they've died, they come back as these zombies. And if one of them is able to grab a living person, that person then falls ill and they die, mm -hmm. and they join the undead host. And so it's, it could be seen as a symbol for contagion or a pandemic, how a, a disease spreads through this community. Um, and then there's another group of people who die. Uh, the farmer himself is out uh, getting some fish, uh, get, uh, replenishing his dried fish stores, and he drowns with his crew in Breidafjörður, north of uh, Snæfellsnes. 
Um, and then he comes back to the farm too. So you've got two groups of ghosts coming back so to the farm. Ghosts. Yeah, one, <laughs> one of them they've been buried and so they're all covered in soil. The other ones they drown so they're all covered in water. Um, and they come into the farmhouse and they sort of dominate the fireplace. So the living people can't use it. Mm -hmm. um, so dead people sort of being where they shouldn't be. They, uh, they're there using up the fire. Uh, the living people are cold and it sort of ruins Christmas for them. Or you, the, the saga, it ruins Yule for them because yeah. uh, this happens all throughout winter. Um, Sounds not too dissimilar to uh... yeah, yeah, something to a pandemic that might ruin uh, some festivities this winter. But in any case, um, the, the, the people who live on the farm are fed up with this once once they've spoiled Yule and all the festivities. So they decide that they have to get rid of them. Uh, and actually, in true Icelandic style, with respect for the law and with respect for parliamentary procedure, uh, the living people at the farm actually call the ghosts to a court. This is sort of the, mo the most hilarious aspect of the whole story. <laughs> they call them to a court, and the saga says, because everything was done in the way that it is done properly at a court, yeah. the ghosts arrive when they're summoned, and they're told that they've been wh wh you know, where they shouldn't be, and they accept the charges, and they say, okay, well, fine, we'll go away. Wow. Uh, yeah, so this is a, uh, uh, maybe that's another, another thing to remember if you come across an Icelandic ghost, is court. make sure you've got your charges correct, just, make sure you haven't overlooked anything in yeah. your legal argument, charge them for being where they shouldn't be, and they might leave. Cool. So yeah, you, I mean, do, that you don't actually simple. have to decapitate any of them. Just you just have them. to sue them. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so the the sagas are quite a read. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, have are there any sort of resources or books that can help people who want to get into them, kind of ease their way in? Because I've I'm a reader. Yeah. And I've tried them, and they are terrifyingly yeah, impenetrable. Yeah, some of them are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, is there sort of one that you should start with to kind of ease your way into the others to make them easier? Um, well, I started with Erbigi Saga, like I said. That's mm -hmm. a saga that has a lot of supernatural uh, depictions in it. Uh, it's translated into English. There's a Penguin edition of it, so that's a good one. But I guess if you're looking for a, a, a saga that has everything that the classical family sagas have in them but is less daunting, mm. uh, Gisla Saga is probably the best one. Okay. Uh, because it's it's quite short. It's quite short, but it also has some supernatural things. There are these dream women uh, who visit Gisli in his dreams. Um, another another thing is that s there are some saga genres that are quite often overlooked. So the, the, the family sagas are the most famous, mm -hmm. um, but but there are other genres. Um, what one in particular is called the is usually called the Fortnalda Sagar or the legendary sagas. They are usually shorter and, and, and they are quite interesting for supernatural uh, things too. Okay. There's a Penguin edition called uh, Seven Viking Romances, which contains uh, seven quite short stories. One mm -hmm. of them is, is, is long, but the other six are quite short. Uh, so that's a good one. Um, and in terms of scholarship on trying to think about trolls, uh, there is an excellent book that came out recently by uh, Professor Auman Jakobsen, who is a professor at House School of Eastlands, uh, called The Troll Inside You, um, which is quite short and it's written in a very accessible way. And it sort of talks about how we can analyze uh, paranormal and supernatural things that go on uh, in the sagas. Um, and I'm also about to launch a blog where I will uh, write articles about things that the broader public might find yeah, interesting about cool. my research. So, that, you know, just talking about one story at a time, yeah. talking about what, what it might symbolize. That's cool. What's um, that blog called? It's called uh, MatthewRoby.com. I'm sure we can put it in the YouTube you will, description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my us. pleasure. It's thank really you. It's always nice to share about the sagas. So. Absolutely. And good luck with the rest of your research. Thank and you your very blog much. And thank your you. Book. Very exciting. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe and um, join our High Five Club if you haven't already. <laughs>